recording. What's up, y'all? It is Zap, your EC program manager. Thanks so much for tuning in today. For our folks who are in Nashville uh, and looking to capitalize on those free lunches, uh, just to let you know, tomorrow, Wednesday at 12 o'clock, we do have an EC member lunch. Uh, it's been quite a minute since I've had one of these. So come, I think I'm getting Chagos. So if y'all like, my, it's my favorite lunch, at least. I picked my favorite for the first time back. Uh, Chago's great local Mexican spot uh, will be catering, so feel free to join us at noon. But for today, I'm super stoked to have Brian Adams, EC advisor, coming to talk about, honestly, the hottest topic that comes across my desk all day, every day, but raising capital. Uh, Brian is the president and founder of Excelsior Capital. He is also an EC advisor, so it's so cool as you get to hear from him today. But if you do want to dive a little bit deeper, you can shoot me an email and I can figure out how to help make that happen for you. Um, thanks so much for joining us again. Feel free to type questions into the chat. Um, and then at the end, we'll open up for Q&A. And then you are welcome to unmute yourself, uh, turn your cameras on so we can see you, or you can all hide. That's all right, too. But uh, you can ask your questions and give some context or just type them into the chat. Uh, and I'll read them once we get to that portion. Uh, but anyways, Brian, thanks so much for being here and I'll hand things over to you. Thanks, Zap. <clears throat> really appreciate it. Thank you all for, for joining and, and taking the time. I'm gonna spare you actually doing the PowerPoint because I think it's painful enough. Um, but this whole presentation is it's just like Zap said, how to effectively and efficiently raise capital as a first-time entrepreneur. Um, I originally put this presenta presentation together oriented towards commercial real estate. That's my core business because this is far and away the number one question I get is, you know, how to go out and actually start getting the capital together to launch whatever venture I'm working on. And I think it's a really misunderstood skill set. So if you want to go see the original presentation, which again is more oriented towards commercial real estate, you can go to our website and you can access it for free. I'm sure Zap will share it in the show notes or the recordings, or I can send it to you if you connect with me, but it's excelsiorgp.com and you can go check it out. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to talk about kind of generalities, but again, my background is in commercial real estate. Um, and so the title is how to reverse engineer your pitch to accelerate your uh, fundraising forward. And there's a lot of parallels between commercial real estate and venture capital. There's a little bit of context. My, my wife's family has a, a family office that in, invests in venture capital, uh, mostly in the healthcare space. So I've certainly interacted with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, I've talked to a lot of portfolio companies and even the ones that are really exciting and doing good things really struggle with the capital raising. Um, and even when we're talking about kind of later rounds, A round, B round, C rounds, it oftentimes is something that is, um, a lot of founders don't think it's their job and they think it's beneath them and they're pretty bad at it in my experience. So hopefully this will give a little bit of context and again, help you think about how to efficiently raise capital from a, from a cost of customer acquisition standpoint in terms of how much time and money you're spending on this. So, the reality is that just like commercial real estate, launching a venture, starting as a venture capital um, funded uh, enterprise, especially seed stage, super capital intensive, right? You just need to come to terms with that the reality that you're now in a capital raising um, commitment, and it's going to be something that's part of your journey as an entrepreneur. So a big mistake that I see folks make is they say, okay, well, when I get enough funds or when I get to this next round of funding or level of capital, I'll hire a salesperson. I'll bring a third party fundraiser in. I'll just really put money towards my marketing efforts. And the reality is, unless you're going to embrace being the chief sales officer of your enterprise, you will fail. You cannot outsource that functionality. Nobody will ever know your company or be as passionate about your company as you are. So unless you embrace that, Think your chances of success are, are drastically lower. Um, to give context, and I'm going to go into this later in the presentation, this is not meant to talk about how great I am or how much capital I've raised, but I'm providing you context here. 
so that I can have some bona fides with you and try to build some of this relationship over Zoom. Over the last 12 years, I've raised over $150 million of equity. And that's been from individuals, family offices, and private wealth management firms. So that's everything from $10,000 checks to $5 million checks, but all non-institutional limited partner investors. So I've been down this path. I started working out of a coffee shop. I've, I've made all the mistakes. I stepped in the potholes. My core business today is capital raising, sales, and marketing. So this is what I live, live and breathe every day. Um, but again, the last couple of deals that we've done, we've raised three and a half million dollars on each acquisition in under 12 hours. So hopefully that buys me a little bit of, um, of goodwill with the audience. Um, a mistake that I made early on in my career and where I see entrepreneurs really, I think, run afoul is they do the pitch like this. Hey, my name's Brian. I went to this great school in undergrad. Then I went to Wharton. I worked at these fantastic venture capital firms. I worked on Wall Street. I'm super smart. I had this great deal that I know is just going to be a total home run. And you should do it because I'm smart and this is a good deal. And what people do is they spend a lot of time putting together all the materials on the deal itself, right? Talking about the opportunity set, the marketplace, how it's going to change the world. And they put all their time and effort on the front end into the deal. They spend no time pre-marketing it or pre-selling it to their audience or to their logical investor base. So what they do is when they realize, gosh, it's now time to go and raise capital, they take this shiny object that they've created and then they go to their network of friends and family and they just try to cram it down their throat. And they say, you should do this. I'm really smart. This is a great deal. Don't you realize the opportunity that you have in front of you? Now, unfortunately, and I learned this from Michael Burcham, if you have a shiny object that is beautiful, but you can't raise capital around it and you can't scale it efficiently, it's art. And art has a place in our culture, but it is not a business. So you need to understand if you want to be in the art world or the business world. And the issue really is ego, right? When you pitch like that, you talk about your background, how great you are, how smart you are, how smart this deal is, you're leading with ego. And it will work if you have enough time and energy and you're comfortable getting a lot of no's. I mean, if you ground and pound it and you have a big enough investor base that you can go have coffee with and call, et cetera, you probably will get some folks to do this. But it's a very difficult way, in my opinion, to raise capital. And oftentimes the sales marketing and capital raising are a real afterthought for entrepreneurs. They do it in a completely disorganized and slipshod fashion. And again, very inefficient from a time and energy standpoint. So what is the solution? The solution is to put your ego in the back seat and lead with empathy. Empathy is going to be the answer to this problem. So instead of leading with your ego, talking about how great you are and how great the deal is, you need to provide a solution set to your logical investor base that takes care of their problems. Because when you pitch them with your ego, all they're doing in their head is like the teacher from Peanuts. Wah, 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 wah. Because they're asking, what is in it for me? How is this going to help me? How is this going to talk, take care of my problems? So the right way to do this is to use your two ears instead of your one mouth. And before you go out to market and try to raise capital, make a list. And this is a lot of people give advice about how to raise capital in big thematic fashion. And they have these concepts that maybe you can incorporate, but this is a detailed, if you're coming out of the box trying to raise on your first deal, this is a step-by-step -step way to do it. So if you have an idea, but you're not ready to take it to market, but you know that eventually you're gonna to have to raise capital, make a list of a hundred people that you know. A hundred people in your social network who probably are gonna be friends and family and list them starting at the most affluent, most sophisticated investor 
down to the least affluent, least sophisticated investor. So start from one and go to 100. This is not meant to imply judgment against those folks who maybe are you know, on the lower end of the spectrum, but you need to be realistic with who your logical investor base is, and this is how to do it. So you make this list and you start at the top, the most sophisticated, richest folks you know, and you go to them and you don't hard pitch them. You ask them about their experiences being a private investor. Have you invested in a venture capital startup before? Have you invested in a seed stage company before? And if they have, you ask them, okay, well, what did you enjoy about it? What did you not like about it? How did that experience go for you? And you kind of, you're writing all this stuff down, right? I mean, hopefully they want to just talk and you're just a sponge taking all of the details and writing them down. Once they're done talking about their experiences, hopefully they have invested in something similar to what you're going to you know, present to them down the road. Then you ask them, paint me a picture of what the perfect investor journey would look like for you. How would you want the documents to read? What would you want the economics to look like? Would you want it to be an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp? What would you want from, would you want to be common equity? Would you want to be preferred? Do you want to do equity? Do you want to do debt, et cetera? Like no detail is too small here. How would you want to be pitched? Would you want me to take you to lunch or coffee? Or would you want it all in a virtual data room that you can digest at your own leisure and on your own time? Exactly what you would want. And then you take all those details down, right? And then importantly, you need a realistic estimate of what they would allocate towards an opportunity like this. Is it $10? Is it $100,000? It is a million dollars. What makes sense for them? So you do this. And if you're, you know, with COVID, it's a little bit, might be easier, frankly. Um, but you can probably knock this out in 30 days. If you do calls and Zooms and coffees, and you work your way down the list from 100 all the way to one. And you take and incorporate all of this feedback that you get. And I'm not saying that you need to fashion your idea or concept to exactly match it, but to the extent that you can change the parameters of your product offering and your pitch to meet all the feedback and details that you got from these hundred people, it is far and away the, the best way to go out and raise capital because I will tell you from experience, and this is an old adage in the business, if you ask for advice, you'll get money. And if you ask for money, you'll get advice. If you ask for advice, you're going to get money. If you ask for money, you're going to get advice. So when you initially start and you ask for advice, people are going to be pretty open-minded. And then at the end of these conversations, you say, really appreciate your time, Bill, Susan, Miranda. I'm going to be in touch with you in the next six months because I'm working an idea that I think would be a fit for you. And I'd love the opportunity to present it to you and talk further. So you're teeing them up. And most people, if they're friends and family and people you know, are going to say, sure, I would love to take a look at it and learn more when the timing is right for you. Cool. I'll be in touch. So then what you do once you're really ready, once your presentation is ready, once you've recorded the Zoom pitch, once you've put together all the offering documents, you know how much you're trying to raise, you've got your team set up, like all your ducks in a row, you go back to that same list of 100 people, but you start at the bottom and you work your way up to number one because you don't want to go to your top prospect with the first pitch because they're going to ask you a bunch of questions that you don't know the answers to. You're not going to have a lot of at-bats or reps, so you're going to fumble over yourself. If you have a partner, you're not going to know who does which part of the pitch. It's going to be a little messy. I mean, this is iterative, so it always gets better, theoretically, so you could do this a thousand times. But for purposes of coming out the first time, hopefully those first 25 pitches with your kind of least sophisticated, least affluent folks, the probability is low anyway, right? I mean, these are probably people that aren't going to write you a check. 
it's it's low stakes. But once you start creeping to that 50 plus on the top of the list, those are real prospects. Like these are people that might actually invest with you. You do not want to stumble out of the gate and go to them first. So then you work your way in the reverse order all the way up to number one. And this way, it's less of a pitch and it's more of a continuation of a conversation and a relationship that you've built over those previous months when you had that first kind of give advice talk with them. Because now you're saying, Susan, I took into account all of the feedback that you gave me and all the advice and I put together this investment opportunity that I think solves a lot of your problems. You were saying that you don't have access to really interesting healthcare tech deals and that you would like to participate in that $50,000 range. And most of the time you aren't allowed to because the minimums are usually too high for you. Well, here you go. This is an exciting opportunity. It's you know um, close uh, to what you are doing on a daily basis and you can be on the board and the minimums are such that you can participate in this type of offering. It solves your problem. It is a solution set. So instead of calling them up, hard pitching them, this is just a continuation of that relationship you built. And it's just a much easier conversation. Um, so, you know, that is the, the general parameters I would also say now with COVID, people feel much more comfortable on the diligence side, looking at things virtually. So I would take full advantage of this opportunity where you can record your pitch, you, re you can record the frequently asked questions, you re can record the pros and cons. For commercial real estate, for instance, we use drone footage with a pitch that's subtitled. We give everybody the diligence um, that we would give to the lender that they can check it out on their own time. And I think people feel really comfortable committing without necessarily doing an in-person meeting if there's somebody that they already know, if you built a little bit of social capital with them and they can look at it at their own time. I think you'd be surprised and a big fundamental shift that I've seen in my own fundraising is the realization that people don't want me to take them out to a three hour steak dinner that's pretty painful and do the small talk and the banter. And then that awkward pause where I make the ask and they say they're gonna think about it and get back to me. I think now you can just give them all the information and you can say, hey, if you'd like a phone call, if you'd like a coffee meeting, if you'd like a follow-up Zoom, I'm happy to do it and go through the questions you might have or further detail. But everything you need to make your choice is right here. And then it becomes kind of binary, right? They like the opportunity, it's a yes. Okay, well then, what's the number you're going to put on it? Oh, you don't like the opportunity? Okay, I can move on to another prospect. That's not an efficient use of my time. And it's not an efficient use of their time either to spend an hour over lunch when they know they're going to say no to you. So that would be something that I would definitely you know, take time with. And importantly, that gap between when you have that first initial conversation asking your advice to when you actually pitch them, that's when social media, content creation, co-branded content with other service providers, you can really stay top of mind with people and you can tell that story and people can access you on their own time, right? You can start a podcast, you can have a webinar series, you can invite them, you can create value for them and they will think that you're an industry thought leader and you're kind of just tangentially staying close to them without making a specific ask. So these are all things that you can do to help pre-market and pre-sell before you make that initial investment ask itself. Um, because ideally, the best way to do this is to create kind of this magnetism around your brand and the opportunity, and you're attracting like-minded people and prospective investors. So instead of, you know, instead of pushing all the time, through that wall, you're actually just pulling them in and they're coming to you to look for opportunity. That's kind of the way that inbound marketing and in my opinion, the right way to sell will look. Now there's a long way on the spectrum between your first time VC startup pitching to, to where we are maybe as an organization, but the rabbit hole is so deep and you can get so into the details of minutia that the journey never ends. It's just a continuum. 
And the best way to get started on the journey is, is to start. So I know I've been talking for 22 minutes now. This is the presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, again, if you want to access the actual uh, video presentation we put together, you can check out the website. But I can answer any questions that you all might have. But that's my whole spiel. Uh, wait. Yeah, and I just added actually the link in the chat as well if folks want to go click on that and download it. But I think having folks come off of mute maybe to ask questions would be awesome. And I would say if you don't feel comfortable talking in this setting, you can look me up at LinkedIn, shoot me a note, Zap can make an intro. I'm really passionate about fundraising and sales and marketing, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody anytime about any of this stuff. Uh, so I just added the link again, Angela. Yes, Anne Elizabeth. Um, Brian, question for you. As I'm starting to look at the possibility of fundraising, I had not considered it before. How do you differentiate between the um, fundraising for, um, as a fundraising for your business and fundraising for the commercial space that your business may exist in? I'm not sure. Um, Does that make any sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> when, um, so when, whether like the difference in if you want to take on investors in your actual company or if you are really more trying to put together, say, a you need a space for your business and you're trying to put together a set of investors for that space versus investment in your business. Got it. So you're talking about the difference between the operating company or the, the real estate that might occupy or the, the real estate that the operating company might occupy. Correct. Right. So this is a really good question to ask people when you're asking for advice, because, you know, it's like, Hey, would you, do you like investing in private companies? Have you had a good experience investing in venture capital or do you prefer real estate? I mean, is that a better fit for you? And again, this is the really challenging part that I see a lot of people struggle with. And I'm going to start by saying, I have an enormous advantage of owning the privilege of being a white male that went to good schools that married into an affluent family. So I have a social network of high net worth individuals and people that have family offices. That's just people that, that I know, right? Socially, we know a lot of the same people. We look at the same deals. Our kids go to the same school. We have similar experiences. That's who I feel comfortable talking to. Not everyone's going to have that, right? You've got to be realistic with where you are and who you are. Because I talked to people who had, you know, a career in the military, they were enlisted. Well, those are the folks you know, right? They're not going to be able to write the same number of checks. And by the same token, I can't go pitch Vanderbilt Endowment or some big pension plan. Like, I don't know those people. They don't know me. We don't know the same service providers. We don't go to the same conferences. We don't have the same experiences. It's just not realistic. And you can work your way up and down that continuum if you focus on building your relationships and networks. But when you start, I think you just have to have look in the mirror and take a hard look about who actually is going to participate in your offering. Um, and sometimes that can be a real challenge for people. So I think, Anne Elizabeth, to answer your question, it's using those two ears and one mouth and really listening to what people want and what they would prefer and fashioning that product and that offering and that solution set to, to orient towards who they are and what they want to achieve. Thank you. Hey, Brian, I just wanted to say this is fantastic information and thank you so much. Um, you said that we can reach out to you. Um, is there email address that we can get that you might put in the chat or? Yeah, I'm gonna, this is my email. And then um, I'm super active on LinkedIn. So if you connect with me and shoot me a message, um, I'll get back to you, but that's my email. You can drop me a note. Um, I'm happy to help anyone that I can. Thank you so much. Tom, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, you've been talking about uh, approaching friends and relatives. What about approaching actual uh, venture capitalists and angel investors? How do you approach them? Yeah, again, I think you need to be kind of 
do your homework. And when you go to folks in that ecosystem and ask for advice, you need to understand what stage they invest in and what their minimum ticket size is going to be, right? So if you're, if you're doing a seed stage healthcare tech startup and you go out to a bunch of venture capital groups that do you know, $25 million minimum equity checks in late stage companies, that's just kind of a waste of time for both of you, right? You're just not there yet. And even though you can get the meeting, the, the issue is you've got to raise this capital in, in fairly fast fashion. And so you've got 12 to 15 hours a day, depending if you're calling different time zones to be, to be productive and still have some kind of life. And you're looking at hour long coffee meetings or 30 minute phone calls. And it seems like you've got a lot of time of the day, but when you actually look at the numbers, you don't have a lot of time. So you need to be targeted with your approach and thoughtful about how you're organizing your calendar because, you know, Pre-COVID, I would usually say it took six touches to convert a prospect. And that might change depending on their warm introduction, a referral, how I met them at a conference versus LinkedIn, et cetera. But six touches, a touch a month, you're looking at six months before you're going to get a yes or no out of somebody. And your conversion rate is going to be 5%. Maybe, maybe north of 5% if you're really, really good. So if you're trying to raise a million dollars and you think your investor base is going to write $25,000 checks, you do the math, that's a lot of pitches and it's a lot of time. So I would just be really, really thoughtful about reaching out to the right people in the right way. Um, and that's, that's, but that's about, I think, again, you can work your way up that continuum. But I think starting out at a gate, um, it's really just a function of cost of customer acquisition from your time and energy. Because you can spend, I did this, I made this mistake. I chased endowments for like three years and I got a bunch of meetings. I got, I met 26 endowments, zero dollars. Flying around the world, trying to go to these conferences, getting these introductions, getting these meetings. And looking back on it, it was a total waste of time. So how do you, how would you begin that, especially if it's in a field that there aren't very many investors, aerospace, uh, like you said, going to conferences, most investors are doing oil or they're doing medical or mom and pop type investors, investments. Very, very few are doing anything in aerospace. Yeah, so I'm not gonna pretend to know anything about aerospace. But when you're yeah, talking about- Most SO people don't. <laughs> Actually, I do know a couple of folks. You want to talk to me offline. I know some families that work in that space, but I personally don't know anything about it. When you're talking about esoteric spaces like that or niche investments, a really good way to backdoor capital raise is to only work with third-party service providers that are in those ecosystems. Like so, who? Who's so, a person? Right. So I've, I do a presentation about this as well. There's a thing in commercial real estate called a settlement statement, which basically says when you acquire, like if you've ever bought a house, you get one of these. Every third party that makes a fee on your deal gets listed out. So when you're starting your company, you've got legal, accounting, audit, what, you know, whatever third party service providers you're working with, you should only work with groups that are going to be value add beyond the commoditized service that they're providing. And what I mean by that is introductions, events, um, you know, cap, cap, capital raising, introductions, people that operate within the aerospace world will have connections, right? And you should not work and give a fee away to any group unless they're gonna reciprocate and make three to five introductions for you. Otherwise you should shop that work. And you might have to do some digging and do some homework, but I promise you there's some CPA firm, actually I actually think I know one in DC, that only works in the aerospace industry, right? Well, if you work with that group and then you work internally and say, okay, well, who are the VC groups or the family offices that are investing in these type of startups? They will know that ecosystem. Then they will make introductions, they'll invite you to events, they'll try to get you in the mix there 
but you need to leverage all of those relationships to get in the door. Makes sense. I just have to find that first relationship. It's company that can assist me. And, and, that, I'm and a, I, a lot of difficulty finding that one. Well, and that's where places like the Entrepreneur Center and social media can be super helpful. I think you'd be surprised. A lot of people do want to help if you just make the specific ask. So if you come to me, I can't remember who is Tom, I think. You say, hey, I, I need people who are in the aerospace world. Okay, well, I have, you know, 15,000 plus connections on LinkedIn. I'll just shoot a flare up and say, hey, I've got a friend. He needs to connect with service providers in this space. This is his focus. Could anybody help him? And I think if you're very specific with your ask, you'll find that people are really helpful. The problem is a lot of first-time entrepreneurs and fundraisers, they just kind of like blindly walk through the forest and they say, I need help. And like people want to help, but they don't know how to help. You've got to teach them and tell them, I need three introductions to CPA and law firms that work within the aerospace industry and this specific sub-market or sub-sector. And if it's really pointed, I think you can make some good traction there. And that applies across no matter what you're doing, I think. Yeah, that, that, that all made sense. That, that was a big help. Any other questions from the group? Um, I have one. What about if we've come up with an idea rather than say uh, an investor as per just somebody that's going to invest to approaching a large company which you could partner with like I'm working on a, a music project and I've come up with an idea to look at getting Uber Eats on board and I don't I won't need necessarily a huge amount of capital but what it will do in turn is create a, a greater um, ROI on their investment on an ongoing basis um, is that an avenue worth pursuing, for instance? I mean, I haven't given you all the details, obviously, but uh, in terms of raising capital, rather than it being a very strict funding round as per se, which you're discussing. Yeah, I think the principles still apply, right? And oftentimes, again, I see this within the healthcare industry specifically, entrepreneurs will work on an idea and they'll be in the garage tinkering away for thousands of hours and they'll go pitch it to HCA. And then they're like stunned that HCA doesn't love it. I'm like, well, did you go to HCA and ask them if they had this problem? And if, they, if it would solve, it would make their life easier? I'm like, no, I just, I know it will. Well, you could have saved yourself a lot of time and effort if you went to HCA and their five competitors and you knew exactly what their pain point was and you came to them with a solution set and ask for that strategic partnership, I mean, that's a much better way to go about having that's, that conversation. That's great because I did a bit of research on Uber Eats and they do almost a hundred million dollars in, you know, in advertising. You know, and it'd be interesting to know what the return on investment is. And but, I know some folks that work at, at Postmates, so I can happily introduce you to them. I would uh, love to yeah. connect with you. So I'll hit um, Zap up for yep. to connect with you, if that's okay, Zap. Okay. I see a lot of folks off camera. I feel like that means y'all have questions. I'd just like to say thank you for being the most valuable information. It's just amazing beyond words. I think it's something that people don't feel comfortable talking about. If for whatever reason, they don't like the title of being a salesperson. They don't like to talk about capital raising. Um, and it typically gets short shrift and it's just not a focus. But I think you'll find increasingly companies that have the most market share, especially in the tech space, and real estate is becoming a tech play in a lot of ways. It's not necessarily the folks that are the best operators that have the best code. It's the folks that are the best marketers. Mm. But what you've just laid out as being so valuable because I think people aren't comfortable because they don't know how to approach it. That's what you've just laid out and with that little bit of information was just light bulb. Well, I mean, fundamentally, you're asking people to, to, to exchange their resources, be it time or money, in, in exchange for a product or an offering that you have. 
And so it's just going to be logically much easier if the solution set you're offering is going to take care of one of their pain points. And it's less of a pitch and more of just a, you know, a conversation. Um, I think it's just a lot easier. Thank you. Yeah, right. Yeah, Brian, thank you so much. And I mean, my question, you might have touched on this before, but, you know, how do you set terms for the investment? Or can you talk a little bit about like, you know, valuation and, and especially at the early stage seed round, you know, how, how do you find like the right amount of percentage to sell or for what, for what value? Yeah. And again, I'm not in the VC space directly. Uh, my family does some of this work, but, I, but I would tell you, um, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to take what the market gives you. Right. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs that they, they cut off their nose despite their face and they really push back on dilution and ownership percentage. But at the end of the day, owning hundred percent of a company that has no market share doesn't really get you very far. And, um, you know, taking that dilution in return for the investment that's going to take you to the next level. I mean, part of this game is staying alive long enough to be relevant. And you're going to have to, I mean, I, I remember very early on, we got pushed around on our fees, which is kind of the equivalent in my space to valuation all the time. And it's just kind of the price of, 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 entry into this world. Sometimes you're going to get kicked in the teeth and you're not going to like it in terms of valuation or fees, but if it allows you to do something full time and stay relevant and stay in the game long enough, I think it's just kind of the price you have to pay. Um, but, you know, I would go to your top 10 investors and have them beat up your document with their attorneys and third parties and negotiate really hard but then it becomes a take it or leave it type of thing, right? Once your core anchor investors are signed off on it and you start going down the list of your smaller checks, you're not going to go back and modify the agreement for 5,000, 10,000, whatever the number is investor, right? It becomes a take it or leave it document that's already been blessed by XYZ mm -hmm. people that hopefully they're comfortable with you using their name, right? Like, hey, Bill Smith has already said grace over this. And Bassberry already beat it up and redlined it. It is what it is at this point. I would like you to participate, but I'm not in a place where I can go modify this agreement. I have a question along those same lines. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, my problem is I need uh, some small investors to get started. And those are very more important to me than the large investors, but I need some investors who are ultimately going to come up with $250 million. But right now, I just need like forty-five dollars to $50,000. And I'm willing to pay them. This is the question. But should I be willing to pay them like five times or 10 times their investment? Because $45,000 times 10 is only $450,000. And the income is going to be hundreds of millions of dollars in the first year. So I can afford to pay five or 10 times small investments to get started. I mean, that's your call. I don't know your part, company. I don't want to get away part of the company for $45,000. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how badly you want to be in this space. Um, I mean, I think if you look at really mature VC backed companies, um, it's really who comes to market first nowadays, right? Um, that matters a lot more. That's why there's so much VC funding, bigger and bigger deals, later stage deals, because it's all about kind of market share. Again, I don't know your situation, but if it means you can get out of the coffee shop and, and go out and do the work that you want to do and you think there's a big opportunity set, I mean, how much money do you really need? Do you, do you think it's reasonable to give a small investor a, a big, big return on their money to get to get started. So I'm running into problems where people say, well, do you have any investors? State will help me with funding some of the project up to 25 million, but they don't, 
want to do it until I get some investors. And that's what I've been finding because my project is so unusual. Yeah, I mean, I think you're just going to have to swallow that bitter pill. Can I ask you a question, Brian? Sure. Um, I have an intellectual property that has thrown me a lot of curveballs in that certain um, people I'll serve would prefer that I had certain credentials I don't have. Um, I looked into getting them. It didn't work out. There are collaborative people who have them in my circle. There are researchers in my circle to um, I'm working at the level of getting real clarity on the pain points. Um, so my solution is definitely as tight as it can be. Um, so I'm right at that juncture where I'm doing all of that and just starting on doing everything you're talking about. Would you offer anything sequentially for me to just keep thinking this through and taking action? I've loved what I've heard today, thank you. Yeah, sure. So the, the, the question is how to get other people engaged. I, I mean, just as a with a, an intellectual property as a product that needs to be proven, that has tentacles related to, well, do you have science and empiricism on this? I'm working on it. Um, you know, I'm running out of my own resources and I'm trying to just bridge the gap of how do I stay afloat with this, stay with the relevance, you know, building team. I, ha I have interesting people showing up, um, you know, and so I'm, I, it's just a lot to, to, to field. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's where I think looking, um, looking at... Um, strategic partners like if there's an intellectual property attorney you work with giving them some sweat equity in the in the in the enterprise so that you know they're continue to work on the project and be invested without you having to put more of your own capital into it probably I makes a lot that. of sense i mean yeah. i actually have a pro bono attorney but i i mean i i i don't i can't keep pushing that envelope may, in, with that person maybe i'm sorry yeah but i'm working down that road Please continue. Yeah, yeah, or you know, looking at private public partnerships with academic institutions that have um, okay. intellectual property transfer agreements. Like I know Vanderbilt okay. has one. Um, that might be something to look into. Okay. Uh, I, I know that you can get grant grants done with a lot of these uh, groups. Yeah. Um, right. Again, it's not my world. We invested in intellectual property sure. tech company. Um, that I know they're really focused on that space, um, but that's where I would I would probably okay. start. I may take you up on continuing this conversation, okay? Yeah, sure. Because it's a very relevant, unusual solution to a very time-oriented um, issue on the planet, and I really don't see anybody doing this, and that's why I have the interest that I do have, and so I appreciate getting to know you. Yeah, please shoot me a note. I'd be happy to help me where they can. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Oops. Zap, do I get to go to lunch? You can come to lunch, of course. Yeah. Tomorrow, right. you should come to lunch. I'm just hearing about it now. I must not be on your distro list. Are you actually not well, on my distro list? <laughs> No, I think I saw your note. I just oh, okay. I'm I in, was worried. Well, I'm in El Paso. <laughs> right. So you can make it. Right. Actually, I have one more question that's kind of uh, tangential, but like, if if you're somebody who wants to do great capital raise kind of professionally, like if you want to kind of follow in your footsteps or be you know actually raise a fund that you then you go out and invest in other companies, like, what advice do you have for somebody like that or just starting out? You know, any any just tips of the trade or. Do you even recommend going down that route? Yeah, so I personally, I personally think raising capital for third party groups that you're not directly affiliated with or, or have ownership in is a really tough business. I think it's really challenging because fundamentally you're leveraging your relationships for the benefit of other people into entities and enterprises that you have no direct control over. And so for me, my investors, it's really important for me 
that I have my own CRM, I have my own email distribution list, we have our own marketing plan because those relationships and my brand, and I tell the younger people that I work with this all the time, your brand and your relationships are portable in good and bad ways. Good because you can bring them with you and do different things. And if you treat people the right way, they're going to continue to trust you. Bad because those, those negative experiences will also come along with you, right? And I think like 2008, COVID has taught us you're only as strong as your networks and your relationships. And capital raising is a very intimate thing. And even though you might learn about me from a podcast or a webinar or what I post on LinkedIn and social media, once we connect and once you participate in one of my offerings, you're like, you're in my tribe. And like it or not, you're going to hear about everything I think about. I'm going to try to provide as much value to you beyond the investment itself. But it would, it would, I don't, I can't imagine a scenario where I would open up my book to somebody else. I think it's a really tough business. If, unless you're dealing with institutional groups who don't really, they, they rip your face off for a dollar, like that's a different business. But you're talking about individuals and families. I think it's tough. Yeah, that brings uh, to my question. Uh, can I ask? Sure. Uh, in the absence of eyeball to eyeball meetings, right? Uh, how do you break ice? Because uh, if you're introducing a new concept and, uh, uh, you know, that is something we are struggling with. How do we, we would love to see eyeball to eyeball meetings, but it's, you know, it's getting difficult to get those. So what are the, your experiences, uh, tips and tricks? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you've got to look to your affinity groups. And there's a, a rule of thumb in our industry that you should talk about five topics or be the master of five subjects because everybody listens, to, everyone hears a different frequency. Like there's a million white dudes like me that pitch commercial real estate. Like it's nothing different, but different people hear my frequency and different people have an affinity to the things that I have an affinity with. So in addition to your core business, I would start creating content and posting things and start having, turning on that magnet around whether it's health and mindfulness, sports, hobbies, other intellectual interests or pursuits, pick five things that you're passionate about that you like to talk about. And you'll start to have people gravitate towards you from those affinity groups. Because once you have a similar thought process around things like that, people will just naturally start to talk about what you do. It'll turn to investing. There'll be that talk and conversation, like it'll come. But it's much better to start from a shared relationship. And that's where it's hard because of COVID, we don't have shared experiences anymore, really. Right. But you can recreate them by saying, like, I'm a huge hockey fan. Okay, well, like, let's rap about the Predators for 10 minutes. Right. And then it's, oh, what do you do? Well, I do this. Oh, what do you do? Oh, yeah, I know so-and-so that works over there. That's... Yeah, that's... those absence of pre- and post-conversations. So you're... You just got to recreate them through, con oh, through content, podcasts, webinars, social media, clubhouse, and start putting yourself out there. And it's awkward, but if you're consistent and thoughtful and you have like a content calendar, you'll start to connect with people who are like-minded. Interesting. Thanks. Zap, you and I can do a crew one. It'll be great. A rowing one? Yeah, it'll be like, yeah, it'll be sick. Hey, big, I ten, have big 10 rowing. It'll be, a, it'll be awesome. Uh, I just had a rower move in with me. She just moved to Nashville. It's the only woman I know in Nashville who's bigger than I am. <laughs> Anyone who wants to come see her, you can come visit my house. Talk about, yeah, Des Moines. It'll be good. <laughs> Any final questions, folks? 
I feel like people are staying on the call, which means that y'all have questions. Yeah, I mean, you've got me for whatever we, we have we've eight got, more minutes. So or I'm we happy can wrap to... up now. Or Brian and I can just start our own rowing <laughs> talk show. How's your house? Is the flooding is okay? Oh, wait. Oh, Joe, go ahead. Did Sorry. You say something? Oh, I, I was, I was going to ask about Clubhouse and what, what you thought about Clubhouse and best use cases. I, I haven't figured out how to use it or like what it's for yet. So I'm curious on your take. Yeah, so it's a good question, right? Like how to leverage social media to capital raise, build relationships and network. This starts by creating your avatar, which is basically um, your ideal customer profile. So for me, I, we have two or three of them, but they're very distinct. And we spent a lot of time putting together our avatar of exactly who our logical investor is, like who loves us, who we work with the best, et cetera. And then you spend time where they spend time. So for us, it's LinkedIn and YouTube, like professionals and family offices, like that's where they gravitate towards. That's where we can interact with them. That's where we can build relationships and connections. Clubhouse is not as much their cup of tea. So I don't spend a lot of time there, but I think I would start with, you know, if your, if your people are on TikTok, then you need to be on TikTok. Like if you're people on Twitter, you need to be on Twitter. I think it's really hard to do multiple social media platforms unless you have a team. So I would just double down on, on two. And again, consistency in your content production will go a long way. Um, I'll add, I think Clubhouse is really tough for Nashville. Um, it seems to be really big in New York and the Bay, but the Nashville, I mean, if you're looking for investors in Nashville, it's just, they're not on Clubhouse. I would stick to LinkedIn. But if you're looking to go for New York and LA, maybe Clubhouse would be the way. Yeah. I think Clubhouse has been good. At least Clubhouse for me has been good for more topical discussions, finding people that are experts in their subject area. Um, that's what it's been good for, for me, not necessarily for customers or for um, investors. Yeah, I mean, I think of Clubhouse kind of like I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and The Economist, because that's what my investors read. And I need to know what's on top of their minds. So Clubhouse might be a good way for you to say, OK, well, my tribe, like my group is worried about this or they're interested in that. And you can use that as kind of fodder for your content. But at some point, you need to take them from the social media platform into your platform. Right. That's that's the key is that continuation of that first initial contact into building the relationship between directly. Brian, I just started some of that and I'm glad you brought that up of having numerous avatars. Um, in the science proven direction of my work, there's one avatar. Um, it's been brought to my attention and my um, qualitative and quantitative research will give me better ideas, but there are other more generalist audiences. And so I just started to be consistent um, in one and it, it, it's confusing. I don't want to scatter shoot, but I love what you said. Um, if science was on my side right now, I would go and just specific target niche, the one select group. That's a longer haul for me. The chances are you know, greater if I do a generalist and not specific, you know, niche specific approach. And so if you could just see what you can share back at me based on what you said about multiple avatar um, work that you do at your firm, because uh, I'm just brand new at this two weeks new. Yeah, you've got to segment your time, right? So for me, I've got my bread and butter investors who I've got a really good vibe and sense of what do I need to do to interact with them? What my conversion rate's going to be, my close rate, how many prospects I need, et cetera. But then I have more aspirational investors who I know the sales cycle is going to take longer and they're going to need more diligence. They're going to need more handholding. They're more high touch. And you just need to proportionally spend your time and focus to make sure that you're like feeding the beast with the folks that you know you, you can kind of interact with and convert. 
but then also spending time aspirationally to make sure you're moving up on that continuum to where you'd like okay. to be eventually. Okay, but in the tweaking of your avatar to each group, consumer group, um, can you address that? It's like, I don't want to feel like I'm not clear in my offer, but each niche does have me tweaking a little bit. And that's cool, right? Yeah, I mean, that's just the nature of the game. I, I probably have three avatars and I, I'll change my pitch up depending on, but depending on who's on the other side of the table. Right? Sweet, okay, thank you. Awesome, well, it's 1.58, perhaps we wrap up now. Um, Zap, I'd just like to say tomorrow at lunch, would you have a taco on my behalf? I will have a taco. I'll say Thank this taco you. is for Kelly. And have a margarita for me, Zap. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, if you want the drinking event, that's on May 13th, okay? I haven't, I will say my last two in-person events where we had drinks, people got a little tipsy. Uh, I think that they didn't know how to get out of the house. Everyone's tolerance, I thought, would be high. <laughs> So it's fun. It's fun. But uh, all right. I'd just like to say thank you. This has just been so valuable. And Brian, the way you presented it, it's beyond words. I'm, I'm really speechless at just how priceless this information's been and how well you've presented it and made clarity on the process and everything. And my mind's just going around and around and it's like I feel like there's a way forward now where I felt stuck yeah That's I'm awesome. happy to help I'm, I love I love helping other people kind of enter in the space and start the companies and be entrepreneurs and capital raising is just part of this and, and it enables you to go out and execute um, and you know Zap paid me a ton of money to be here so I'm happy to happy to do this <laughs> big budget well, just Thank you. Thank you all. Please reach out if I can help. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.